multiple critical vulnerabilities found, over 2 million user IDs and counting, 4 attempts to report what we discovered, and 0 responses. Our security organization, Melectrica, is in the business of finding and reporting vulnerabilities. We do this to make money, we do this for fun, but most importantly, we do this to make the internet a safer place for everyone, regardless of whether we receive payment for our services. In this pursuit, we occasionally look for vulnerabilities in sites we use, in a legal and responsible manner, of course. If you've ever read manga before, chances are you've seen one of these logos. Look familiar? It should. Many of these domains come up first when trying to search for manga online. What you may not know is that all of these sites use the same user database. They are all owned by the same company. And this means that attacks on the authentication and authorization systems found on any one of these websites apply to each and every one. So naturally, that's where we started. To our surprise, it took not days, not hours, but minutes to find a vulnerability. And it looked like this. But first, you need some background to understand what's happening here. When you sign up for one of these websites, you're really making two accounts. And there's an account that you use to view and bookmark manga on the root domain, and there's an account on the user subdomain used to edit your profile details, reset your password, and otherwise manage your data. When you create an account on this user subdomain, you are sent back to the root domain and automatically logged in. But as any good wizard will tell you, My parents' divorce was rough, man, but having two Christmases is pretty cool. And also that magic is dangerous if you don't know what you're doing. Turns out, this auto-magic process is done using a very suspicious looking link. The more tech-savvy of you may see it already. Base64 encoding. And with a little pondering of our orbs, we can see that there are two important parameters using this encoding. They are the account's username and user ID. After creating a few test accounts, we also see that there's a pattern in the user ID. The IDs are incremented by one each time a new account is created. This method of giving direct access to objects like accounts based on user-controlled inputs is called an Insecure Direct Object Reference, or IDOR for short. Combined with the fact that these IDs are extremely predictable, we had discovered the first of many account takeover attacks and whipped up a little proof of concept script to test our findings. And boom, we've shown impact. This means that an attacker could take over any account with a known username in about 8 hours on one machine, far less if they know the relative time period the account was created in. Which by itself is mildly significant due to the minimal functionality of the root domain accounts, but is dwarfed in comparison to what we found later. A commonly overlooked vulnerability in authentication systems is user enumeration. Imagine you're creating an account and you try a username that already exists. You might think it's useful for the website to tell you that the username is taken rather than just saying it's invalid. And well, it is. But surprise, surprise, it's a lot more useful for an attacker. And to no one's surprise at this point, that's exactly what we encountered. Now, we have a way to check if a username exists and a way to log in to any account with a known username just by trying all possible user IDs. We can almost take over every account on the root domain. However, there are two mitigations we haven't talked about yet that might prevent us from being able to achieve this. The first is rate limiting. If these websites were to only allow a small number of requests in a given period, say, five per minute, it would be a waste of time to attempt brute forcing accounts. Unfortunately, these websites have zero rate limiting. In fact, we were astounded with the lack of rate limiting seeing as they are hosted by Cloudflare, a purportedly reputable and security aware hosting platform. The second is something you've definitely seen before, a CAPTCHA challenge. You may believe that these are only used to frustrate you and induce existential crises about how much of an object you need to see for it to count as being in the image, 
but the secondary purpose is to prevent automated interaction with applications. Some are quite effective, and others, like the ones on these sites, are so trivial they can be bypassed in a couple lines of code. And the cherry on top? We found not one, but two ways to bypass them without ever writing a single line of code. Firstly, we can replay a CAPTCHA by sending the same headers in multiple requests. This lets us use an identical CAPTCHA solution for any request we make. Additionally, there are several instances of CAPTCHAs being used before redirects, to endpoints that perform actions on accounts. We don't ever need to complete a CAPTCHA if we simply navigate directly to those endpoints. With this, an attacker that knows basic Python can control any user account whose name they can brute force. This would likely be over half the site within a few days. And there was nothing left for us to do on the root domain, so we set our sites on the user subdomain, where vulnerabilities have more impact. We noticed that accounts have fields to store email addresses and phone numbers, which will be important later, so keep it in mind. Again, within a matter of minutes, vulnerabilities were flying left and right. It was hard not to get smacked in the face by one. And the first major thing we uncovered was a set of cross-site request forgery, or CSRF, vulnerabilities. Cross-site request forgery is a type of attack that takes advantage of authenticated sessions to force victims into unknowingly performing actions, like updating or deleting their accounts. And these sessions are often stored inside objects called cookies. When you try to perform some action on a website, you attach some cookies to the request. The website's guard dogs focus on the cookies. Your request goes through, and the action is performed on your account, without the need for any username or password. Unfortunately for victims of this attack, taking an action on a website can be as simple as clicking a link. For demonstration purposes, we created a little website that will automatically force your account to change its password. All it takes is one click, and control of your account is lost. This doesn't only apply to user passwords, however. Other actions, such as updating a user's email address, are also possible. Of course, there are many mitigations that could have prevented these CSRF vulnerabilities, but for the sake of this video's length, we'll skip the details. If you'd like more detailed explanations, information on our future projects, or you just want to have a chat with us, feel free to join our public Discord server. Finally, looking back on our findings, we had everything. Ways to get into over 2 million accounts from both domains. We were done, right? But there was still this creeping suspicion that this was not all there was to find. We can get into user subdomain accounts if someone clicks a link we send them, but it's not enough. Yeah, see where I'm going with this? Yep. Turns out, when you send a request to recover your account by changing your password, it doesn't send a secure link to your email like most modern websites, no. Only two pieces of data are sent to verify your identity. It checks your email address, and for those of you playing security fail bingo, your username. If you'll recall, this site allows username enumeration, meaning the only thing standing between an attacker and every account on every website is knowing the email that links to an account. And with that, our bug hunt came to a close. Now, you studious and attendant viewers will remember an earlier mention of email addresses and phone numbers being stored in accounts. To an average manga user, losing an account's not a big deal, but it could go further than this. As our assessment was winding down, we came to the realization that some of the content on these websites ranges from weird to embarrassing to morally questionable and beyond to the point that a person's email, phone number, or username being linked to one of these accounts and the specific content that is bookmarked poses a risk of extortion. After discussing this as an organization and seeing the lack of response from the owners of these websites, we arrived at the conclusion that public disclosure would be the best way to protect possible victims, to educate the public about these vulnerabilities in a broader context, and to spur the owners to remedy the issues that endanger their users. That said, this is our first video. All feedback is welcome. Let us know what you thought in the YouTube comments or in our Discord. And of course, stay vigilant. See you soon.